Um, and I think we can maybe start our, um, our webinar. So first of all, um, thank you so much for joining us at our first event of 2021. Uh, this is, of course, a webinar both to celebrate the Day of Zero Tolerance uh, for FGM, which is tomorrow, but it's also to launch the new annual campaign of NDFGM European Network. Um, the NDFGM European Network, for those of us who don't know us, is an umbrella organization having 30 members across 14 European countries, um, and we're the leading organizations in Europe fighting to eliminate FGM. Every year we do a different campaign, mainly through social media and uh, like on communications. And we explain and explore a topic that surrounds FGM. For those of you that might not be that familiar with FGM, I'm just gonna give a very brief explanation. So FGM is female genital mutilation. Uh, and it's all the procedures that are altering the external female genitalia or other injury to the female genital organs for non-medical reasons. This affects 200 million world, women worldwide, and it is estimated that 600,000 women and girls live with the consequences of FGM in Europe. It is a violation of human rights and an issue of gender equality, and the practice of FGM is rooted in the desire to control women's bodies and sexualities. We have a very, very exciting agenda today, and I really hope that you enjoy it. Um, we have quite a few uh, distinguished speakers that have joined us, uh, and we are really, really excited. But I would like to kick off the webinar with our keynote speaker. Uh, it is my great honor uh, that we have been joined by the EU Commissioner for Equality, Dr. Helena Dalli. She is the commissioner uh, since December 2019. Her mission is to strengthen and implement the commission's commitment to equality. She works to protect the rights of all those who are subject to violence and discrimination, including women, the LGBTQI community, the ethnic and religious minorities. Prior to this role, she has an impressive political career in Malta um, and always had a focus on the rights of women and minorities. With the tr track record she has behind her, I'm sure that we are in for an amazing intervention. And I'm so honored to give the floor over to Commissioner Dayi for a keynote speech. Thank you. Thank you and good afternoon. As you rightly pointed out, Anna, more than 200 million girls and women around the world and at least 600,000 in Europe are victims of FGM. But according to our European Institute for Gender Equality, a further 600,000 to 900,000 women and girls are at risk of FGM in 13 European countries alone. So this is truly unacceptable. I, I think it's an understatement to, to say this. So the commission is doing all that it can to prevent and eradicate this harmful practice. The approach we are taking is an intersectional one. Taking an intersectional approach I think is crucial as all women are different and may face discrimination on several grounds. Changing the norms and attitudes towards FGM means looking along the different axes that impact women's lives. The European Institute for Gender Equality has just presented its fourth study on the estimation of the number of girls at risk of FGM in the EU. And this study shows that while the number of girls and women at risk has gone up, awareness raising campaigns and specific policies on FGM prove to have a positive impact. The IGA study helps us get a better picture of the situation and to formulate more adequate responses. I plan to table a recommendation on the prevention of harmful practices such as FGM. To end FGM, we need to explore all possible avenues to find solutions and build alliances. 
It is particularly important to support the work of local community-based activists in fighting against FGM. They are best placed to identify the real issues and find ways to address them. As with all gender inequalities, many issues are linked to negative gender dynamics and gender stereotypes. Listening to and working with survivors, impacted communities and experts, I think it is crucial to address misunderstandings and misconceptions about FGM. This means avoiding, avoiding stigmatization, racism, and xenophobia. This goes hand in hand with the EU Anti-Racism Action Plan, which we presented last September. The action plan lays down measures to enhance concrete actions in addressing racism more effectively, in combating discrimination, and in lifting the voices of all people with minority backgrounds. Fighting FGM also means educating and raising awareness among girls and boys from an early age and promoting cooperation and dialogue in affected communities and empowering those who reject FGM to build momentum for change. The Commission supports EU member states to address intersectional aspects in gender equality policy by facilitating the exchange of best practices. For example, mutual learning seminars have taken place on support services for migrant and refugee women survivors of gender-based violence, tackling the trafficking of women and girls for sexual exploitation, and preventing domestic violence by involving men and boys. These seminars address the intersection of gender, migrant status, race, and masculinities. Member states may also use funding from specific programs to address intersectional discrimination. The Daphne program has funded many projects tackling gender-based violence, including FGM. It has helped developing the FGM network as well as other community-based initiatives and will continue under the new financial framework. Ending gender-based violence against women sex discrimination and structural inequality are at the heart of EU equality policy. The gender equality strategy 2020-2025 includes actions that address all forms of gender-based violence and harmful practices. I will continue pushing for the EU's accession to the Istanbul Convention because it is the benchmark for international standards for tackling gender-based violence. In case the Istanbul Convention, though, remains blocked, we are preparing alternative ways to strengthen the EU legal framework on gender-based violence. As set out in last year's Victims' Rights Strategy, we also need to work with medical experts, social care services, and law enforcement to guarantee the best support and protect victims of gender-based violence against women. This work on gender equality goes beyond the EU's borders. The EU is a global champion for gender equality and eliminating gender-based violence around the world. Indeed, the third EU Gender Action Plan for 2021-2025 calls to accelerate progress on gender equality and women's empowerment, building a gender equal world. FGM is a violation of women's rights, and we must end this violence here in Europe and around the world. I thank you. Thank you so very much, uh, Commissioner. Uh, I think you can, your words really meant a lot, and I think you can count on us, and I think most people at this webinar as an ally in your investigation on harmful practices that you want to table, as well as in pushing for the EU accession to the Istanbul Convention, as well as any alternative plans that you may have. Um, working, well, having your support on this is invaluable, and uh, we cannot thank you enough for all that you do and for being here with us today. So a big thank you.
this year for our annual campaign, um, we are focusing on the fact that FGM affected communities spread out all over the world and through Europe are extremely diverse. Um, contrary to the stereotype, FGM is not only practiced by communities from sub-Saharan Africa. It is practiced on every continent except for Antarctica. And it is also practicing communities from various ethnicities and religions, including white and Christian communities, for example. FGM affected communities also ex include people from various socioeconomic backgrounds, sexualities, gender identities, as well as people living with a disability or mental health issues. Therefore, for us, this diversity must be accounted for in our work and we must strive to make a space for everyone in our fight against FGM. What does it mean to truly fight for everyone? To answer this question, and you will have heard a little bit about this already in the speech by the Commissioner Dalli, we want to use the tool of intersectionality. I am therefore very pleased to present our next speaker, Aida Yancy, who is an activist and intersectionality expert. Aida is a Brussels-based LGBTQI feminist and anti-racist activist. In recent years, she has taken part in multiple initiatives dedicated to proving, uh, providing safe spaces for LGBTQI people, Black people, and people of color in the socio-cultural and activist sectors. Currently, she works at the Rainbow House here in Brussels, um, the Federation of L LGBTQI Associations in Brussels Capital Region, and she leads the uh, Equal City European Project. Aida will give us a brief introduction to intersectionality and the history and where it comes from. Please, Aida. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm going to wait for Miriam to share uh, my slides, if you may, Miriam, if you're available. Amazing, great. Um, so thank you very much for your invitation. And I'm very, very happy to be here to indeed give a small introduction on what intersectionality is. Um, you can change slides. Um, Ma'am, yeah, thank you. So why an introduction is uh, the main question is because I'm pretty sure most of you have already heard the word intersectionality. Uh, Commissioner Daly actually mentioned it a couple of times in her speech too. And it is a very, very important word. And it, it became quite of a buzzword because it's very common. It's sometimes misused, it's overused, and it can be uh, very misunderstood. So um, I'm trying to remove, voila, <laughs> thank you. So um, let's change slides. I mean, I don't know, I should find a way to wave when <laughs> you need to change slides, Miriam. Yeah, yeah. So um, let's start with the origins of the concept. What is it that we are talking about? So you can change again. Um, <laughs> thank you. So, you have to know that intersectionality is a concept that's rooted in black feminist praxis and theory. So when we say that it's rooted in black feminist praxis, usually people know that intersectionality was coined, is a term coined by Kimberly Crenshaw, who is the lovely person on the right of the screen. Um, but actually the practice behind it, the ideas behind it, and even sometimes even the word intersectionality um, can be traced back to the end of the 19th century in the United States in black feminist circles. On the left, uh, the picture on the left is Sojourney Truth. I don't know if you know her. She was an enslaved woman who uh, petitioned to get voting rights alongside to the suffragettes and was pushed away because she was not considered a woman. And she said this very famous speech that we only have through uh, white people who were there and wrote it down. So we have an account of what she said, and the title is, Ain't I a Woman? Am I not a woman? Explaining how if the ideal, if what we imagine is a woman, is someone who's helped down a carriage, she's not a woman because no one has ever helped her get out of a car. Um, and that if being a woman is someone who doesn't work, well, she's been working and she had 13 children and most of them were sold up and so on and so forth. And explaining how her, her experience differs from other women and yet she's a woman. 
So this entire idea of uh, intersectionality stems from one main assessment analysis is that black women and women of color have a different experience than white women, but also a different experience, experience than men of color because the sexism they face don't have, doesn't have the same, the same taste. Shall we switch? Uh, thank you. So let's go back to Kimberly Crenshaw. This is like the, the, the end of our line in, in the section 90. She's not the end. There are so many other scholars behind her and around her. And she's the first one to acknowledge all of this. Uh, to tell you the, the famous article where she introduces intersectionality is called Demarginalizing the Intersection of Race and Sex, a Black Feminist Critique of Anti-Discrimination Doctrine, Feminist Theory, and Anti-Racist Politics. So this was in 1989. Kimberly Grant, so you see that she's actually referring to, to black feminism uh, and to all of the uh, information that's been uh, created around this. So Kimberly uh, was born in 1959 in the US. She's a lawyer, she's a civil rights advocate and activist. She is a black feminist. And all of this story basically started because as she's a lawyer with a class action lawsuit against General Mothers in the 80s. What happened is that some women were facing discrimination uh, to be hired by general mothers, right? And so we are talking about uh, black women. And when they actually said, hey, there is discrimination here happening, what they were answered is that it wasn't racism. And I, you can actually skip uh, my, my slides, please. So the, the answer they got, they, they got was, well, it's not a question of race. Because as you see, we have black people on, in our organization, in our company. And indeed, there were black men working on, uh, in the workshops to make cars. And then we're like, well, it's sexism. And the answer is, well, actually, we have women in here. Okay, they are all white, but women are working in administration and so on. And so um, what happens there is that when we think of women, when we talk about sexism, we are catering everything to white women. And when we are talking about racism, we are catering everything to black men. And so there's a big hole there in the middle. So if you can switch uh, again, <laughs> next slide, thank you. So I'm showing you the cover of this amazing uh, black feminist anthology called All the Women Are White, All the Blacks Are Men, But Some of Us Are Brave. Um, which is an amazing title and is interesting to point out that indeed, um, I'm going to ask you to, to slide again. Um, basically, we in our society, in society, I mean, and when I say our society, I'm going to stick to a European model and an American model and maybe a Euro descendant model. From there, we actually have a good understanding of what happens in a lot of places due to colonialism and everything. But we imagine that the norm, the, pers the character that we would see in a book and is, and is not defined, if you don't talk about skin color, if you don't talk about gender, if you don't talk about anything else, it's a white man from middle class. And so from there, we imagine black people to just differ from, from one part from this white man here in the middle of my screen. Uh, and so you get the black man who's also cisgendered, I mean, so not trans, who is also straight and so on and so forth. And when we talk about a woman, we take the same man in the middle and we just change the woman part, right? I hope this is clear. It's really, really strange because I don't see all of your faces and this usually helps me see if you're following or not. But let's continue. Uh, man, thank you. So intersectionality, to understand what intersectionality means, you have to picture an intersection of two roads. So here you have the two roads, the one of the sexism, the one of the racism. On those two roads, there, is, there are two cars, the one from racism and the one from sexism. And there is a person in the middle. That person in the middle is a black woman and she's being hit by two cars at the same time. Our society, um, our legislation, our organizations, you put it as you want, is the ambulance that's coming here. And the ambulance is coming to say, well, I cannot save you until I know which car hurt you. Was it the sexism or was it the racism? And as we've seen previously uh, in the story from General Mothers, it's neither, it's both. If you get, and I'm sorry for the very graphic content here, but if you get hit by a car, you get one time of effect. But if you get hit by two cars at the same time, 
the effects don't look the same because maybe, I don't know, if you have two cars together, you may have pieces of the car flying off. So you are creating something that's different and bigger than just one of these roads. I hope you're following. So intersectionality happens when you're in the crossroads in the intersection between two op systemic oppression that just run you over and our system is not built, usually, is not built to give you access to care if you are in the middle of different systems. We work in very single lane kind of systems, right? You can switch uh, slides, please. So when we talk about, uh, we, it starts with racism and sexism. On these roads, you can, have, you can add so many other roads as long as they are uh, systemic oppressions. You will find xenophobia, heterosexism, ableism, uh, classism, homophobia, transphobia, and so on and so forth. I mean, we can find so many other uh, examples. So transphobia is, um, is um, people being against trans people, homophobia is against gay people, or people who are in relationship with people from the same gender and so on and so forth. Um, can you switch again, please? Thank you. So what is a systemic oppression? Just to give you, because I keep saying systemic oppression, it would be good to give you at least a small de definition of what it is. A systemic oppression is an oppression that is, yes, individual, like racism can happen uh, with insults on one-on-one. -on -one that is institutional, so it would happen in school, in hospitals, but also structural, so at other levels of society, um, like governments, uh, but also employment, housing, and historical. So historically, uh, racism is traceable for, uh, has been traceable for generations. We could go for sexism. We know that uh, gender equality uh, is not a new fight, that uh, women have been oppressed for generations. Uh, it, it shows in an individual level. It can show in structural levels, like, I don't know, a single mother trying to get an apartment. And or um, it's also institutional. So uh, in schools, some women do not have access to education on basis of their gender and so on and so forth. Okay, I hope you are right with me right now. So, well, yes, you can, you can move, thank you. So, what's really important to remember now is that intersectionality is not just a concept. The goal is not just to say, well, I have more intersections than you and then I win and it's great. It's not a layer cake. You just don't add on so many, uh, on so many oppressions. No, the point of it, it's a tool, it's to be used. It's a tool to identify issues of access. Because if uh, well, legislation, I don't know, protects people from racism, but don't see it when it's mixed with sexism, or if people are protected against sexism, but not if it's mixed with racism, and then we can add all of the rest, then it's not actually doing a good job. So it's a tool that would look like lenses, like glasses, right? It shows us where our systems, where our services do not reach, where it doesn't work because of the intersection of people who are multi-marginalized. Uh, talking about, I don't know, we could go into social security if you have to read lengthy documents and fill in lengthy documents uh, to have um, basic social help or let's go for basic social help well it will exclude de facto all of the people who cannot read and so that's a problem intersectionality will help us identify that um, so an example that I, to give you a very good image, I'm going to ask you to, to change slides. Okay, thank you. So an example uh, that's very pragmatic, it's the, um, all of the staircases in our city. Right? If you live in Europe uh, and if you've been around uh, any old city, there are a lot of staircases because the cities were conceived by people who could actually climb those stairs. Right? So this was made from a dominant point of view. But now there are actually a lot of people for a lot of reasons who cannot climb stairs because, well, they have a disability, because they have children and push chairs, because they are wearing very, very high heels, because they broke their leg. I mean, there can be many, many reasons or because they are older, many, many reasons for which actually staircases are not a pragmatic answer for a lot of people. You can change that. If instead of uh, having 
people in charge who only who have no issues taking the stairs you realize there are so many stairs a day you are stuck at the bottom of them before that you, you barely see them well if we had people who could not climb the stairs who were planning our cities well we would have ramps everywhere and if you can climb stairs you can climb a ramp so that would actually be part of the so solution so why am i saying this because indeed, it is a tool. It's a tool to identify issues of access, but it's also a tool that requires the involvement of people who are multi-marginalized, which is also the case, for example, in uh, the entire awareness raising movement against FGM. It's important to have actual people who went through it to know what we are talking about, also in part of experience and feeling it, because then you can see all of the loopholes, all, the, all of the ways we forget how, what all the things we didn't see in the way we are uh, raising awareness or fighting against uh, certain practices. I hope this makes sense. So it's important to involve the people who are actually uh, multi marginalized. We can, uh, thank you, shift slides. I mean, I still don't know how to say that in a <laughs> very, in, in a smooth way. So there are several criticism about intersectionality, because intersectionality, uh, especially in French-speaking Europe, kind of popped up uh, a, a decade ago, uh, and it started from universities, right? So it's a tool that comes from feminist movements. So it's a, it's a grassroots tool. It's something that comes from people who are actually in the field, actually working, doing things one-on-one, -on -one, who are really in the fight. And it came from, um, in, in Europe and in French speaking Europe, it came mainly through universities. And one of the criticism we get now is, is this tool universal? Can we use it in the European context, right? And because, and that comes because of one of the main roads that kind of need to be there for it to talk about intersectionality is the road of race. And we don't like the word race in Europe, especially after World War II, we've decided that race was a bad word. So, and intersectionality is based on the understanding of racial discrimination in American context. And the main understanding from the European context is that the American context is different and the racism is not the same and there is racism there, but it's, there is no racism here. But the fact is that the American context doesn't differ from the European one in terms of systemic racism because all of the elements are present in Europe and that systemic racism actually originated here, right? But it differs tremendously in terms of the understanding and acknowledgement of racism. Uh, it's also due partially to uh, the fact that black people and people of color uh, have a different history in Europe than in the US, have been here for uh, in mass uh, in a, for a smaller period of time and have been, they have been established strongly um, for a lesser time too, right? But if to this, to this criticism, I will answer yes. Intersectionality is completely relevant to the European context. It's very important to actually point out how intersections uh, function. I'm going to ask you to change slides. Thank you. The second criticism we get a lot is, is intersectionality a fashionable craze for the younger generations? Because it's all shiny and new. And of course, there have been like, we are not inventing in uh, 2021 in the same way that we weren't inventing in uh, 1989, the concept of fighting from a multi-marginalized point of view. Uh, there have been activists, I mean, even in FGM, uh, the FGM sector, the, against FGM sector have been activists for decades. This is not exactly uh, new. So why are we suddenly springing intersectionality? Well, in practice, intersectionality was always here, right? And we also know that activism differs depending on the, the generations of the activists. And we are talking about age, but also about generations uh, in terms of migration, for example. And we know that, of course, newly arrived immigrants can be very vocal but usually about matters of first necessity first. I mean, physical security, shelter, food. The way um, that they are perceived is not necessarily that their first worry, right? Like racism, for example, is not necessarily the first thing or microaggressions. I mean, when we are fighting with for things that are much more concrete can be uh, considered quite, um, 
quite second class problems right now, right? Um, but people from second, third generations, when we talk about migration, uh, may have settled a little bit and learned the idea of working twice as hard for half as much and have enough comfort in the sense that their first needs may be met in majority to actually perceive, analyze, and rebel against the more subtle obstacles, such as everyday racism or the overall perception of them in society. These two types of activism are essential and complementary. We need to go from all of the senses. When we are working about access for safety, for women and girls, for LGBTQI people, and so on and so forth, we have to have all of the pyramid. We have to have shelter. We have to have food. We have to have physical safety. But we also have to evolve in a place that doesn't bring people down morally, right? Everything is very, very um, important. And they both serve one another, these, both these two types of activism. Uh, we need the analysis of how micro effects are the produce of systemic tendencies as much as the fight for safety and well being of everyone. Right? You can change slides. <laughs> so, in conclusion, uh, I hope I'm in the timing. Yeah, I mean, I'm even a bit early. You see, <laughs> uh, in conclusion, intersectionality is the key to a future where we leave no one behind because it allows us to have a more global vision, a better understanding of systemic transversal issues from a very basic point of view. Just checking, okay, when people are multi-marginalized, what obstacles are coming up? What's happening? If you have a disability, what are the obstacles to you? If uh, you cannot read the language uh, of the place you are, if you are perceived as a woman or a girl, if you faced um, FGMs, if you are queer, if you're a lesbian, if you're bisexual, what happens, for example, and this is something that we're actually working on, is what happens when we have a woman who has faced um, FGMs and is also a lesbian? Where does she talk about her own uh, desires, her own relationship? Where does she go? Um, of course, we could also talk about um, intersex uh, genital, genital mutilation. We can talk about all the things that come together and see where all the obstacles are. And intersectionality is the, I mean, I don't want to sell it. It's not magical, but it's a very good way to at least look at all these obstacles and fighting, finding ways to fight them, to bypass them, right? Instead of going from the top down and trickle and imagine that if we do something from the majority of people, it's going to work, we have to start from the basis. Of course, it's not always easy to sell because the concept when you say this is that um, we are talking about a minority of person. If we are talking about a trans, a person who's disabled, who's a parent, and who has faced FGM. Well, if you have to fight all of the obstacles that person faces, you're facing, you're actually tackling all the obstacles for people who have faced FGM. You are tackling example, you are tackling obstacles for people who are disabled, for people who are parent, and for people who are trans. So it's actually a good gamble to go and find the exception the one that you think that is just a unicorn and just one of them, because the more intersections there are, the more obstacles you actually are forced to think about and try to lay down. I think I'm done. I hope it was clear. I think you'll have time to ask questions later if you need uh, clarification on something. Thank you so much for the really, really interesting presentation, Aida. It was uh, really, really, well, at least I thought it was super interesting and also very clear. Um, I think that also, I mean, the fact that you were bringing up the imagery of like the crossroads and that we're not single lane society was really illuminating. And I hope that it's a really good food for thought for the discussion later on. So thanks once again, and I'm sure if we were all in, in one room, you'd be getting quite a fair bit of applause uh, right now, but uh, happy to continue the discussion afterwards. So um, I want to introduce also our next speaker, uh, where NFGMEU 
very often collaborates with grassroots organizations and activists fighting uh, the practice both locally uh, and at the European level. What our goal is, is to give our platform to our members and uh, members of effective communities uh, and the well young people who are really the true drivers of change. We work with community activists, notably through our ambassadors program, as well as our youth ambassadors program, engaging with adult and youth activists who are fighting FGM within their communities at European and international level and at their local level. Um, these community activists uh, living and working in Europe are also part of a lot of these diversity uh, minority groups that we have. Um, they can both inform uh, their work and create challenges for them. We have therefore asked our ambassador Hadil el Shak to join us today and give us an insight into her experience as a young activist. Hadil is a student and are currently studying international development with Arabic. She's passionate about increasing women of color's inclusivity within society specifically, which has been reinforced through uh, interning with uh, the Joe Cox Foundation. Her activism is focused on sexual and gender-based violence against women um, and working as the, ooh, you'll have to excuse my pronunciation here, but I think it's Tuezeshe Fellow at Forward. <laughs> as an NFT, NFGM EU network ambassador. She has been very involved in our international campaign, The Purple Chair, which is an excellent YouTube series. You should check it out if you haven't, uh, which focus on knowledge of youth threats. So Hadil, um, we are so happy to have you here and I leave the floor to you to give us your presentation. Thank you, Anna. Um, I'm going to wait for Miriam. I think she's got my presentation. Uh, perfect. Thank you, Miriam. Um, yeah, so as Anna said, my name is Hidil El Shak. Um, I am one of the many um, youth ambassadors with the NFGM EU network. Um, and I will just be talking a bit about um, my personal experience with um, youth activism and how uh, intersectionality comes into play with that. Uh, so, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, yes, so I think um, it's important just to share uh, parts of my identity, which I think um, really informs my experience. Um, and as um, Aida said um, in the uh, in explaining, um, you know, giving the example of uh, racism and sexism, I am a black woman. So that um, I think from as early as I can remember, I was always very politically engaged and always very interested, um, very interested in uh, activism. Um, so yeah, as you as you can see here, there are uh, parts of that I'm, my identity that I've put up. So being Muslim, being black, being Sudanese, uh, being a woman, being young, and being first generation in the UK. Um, so for example, with uh, being Muslim, Sudanese and a woman, um, those are all things that um, that uh, impact FGM within Sudan um, and is one of my personal motivations to um, end FGM. Yes, um, and again, uh, being, being young, um, that it's FGM is such an intergenerational issue it's not just isolated to uh, one generation um, and these combinations of my identity they're they're really what drives my personal activism um, and they led to uh, my involvement with working with um, NFGM um, and to being a youth ambassador uh, which I think brings me on to my next slide please Thank you. Uh, so what we have here is the youth manifesto um, that um, youth ambassadors, including myself, actually made. Um, and it's throughout throughout my whole time in um, and FGM, it's we really, you know, I identify that um, in order to make uh, the cause for ending FGM sustainable, it has to be intergenerational and it has to be long term. Again, it just it does not end with um, 
it does not end with the older generation. It, it, it's, it's, it's ongoing and it's a continual, continual cause. Um, and it's crucial to have a uh, young in, uh, involvement with young people. Uh, so this youth manifesto was uh, made by us for other young people. It was very, very um, sort of um, hands on. I remember all of us sitting around and, you know, um, inserting things or scratching out things. Um, and I think this is one of this is a really good example of actively involving the groups that you wish to work with or you wish to benefit. Um, and a lot, a lot of the times, actually, young people are so often misheard and misunderstood and we're dismissed because of our age. Sometimes we are not even allowed in the room because um, in, it, it, it's reserved for adults who know better or, or, or believe that they themselves know what is good for young people um so and if if you isolate that it doesn't sound right to say when we're, we're not gonna involve young people in helping young people it doesn't make sense um so my, my experience with ndfgm has been very hands-on um and it's helped me um empower myself um and be confident and use the fact that i am young uh that does not mean that i am naive it means that I have a lot to offer. Uh, yes, so it, it really does show how it's important to work with young people, with minors, with adolescents in a respectful way and actively involve them, no tokenistic gestures. Um, and yeah, like I said, overall, it makes your work more, more impactful and more and, and sustainable. It creates a long-term approach through working with different generations, uh, which I think leads me on to my next slide about impact. Yes. Um, so as I put here, I think uh, from my experience, what I've seen um, is in, in my activism is that by simply inviting more people in, there is a wider reach. Um, through recognising more than one aspect of someone's identity, you completely open up a movement um, and people join causes because they relate in some form. Um, and by simply widening the pool it really does create a domino effect and impact others to join in um and i personally even though i've stated in in uh, the first slide about my identities and you know if you look at it on paper black muslim these are all these are all things that are deemed marginalized i do have um, a level of privilege and i do have a personal responsibility to inform myself before informing others informing others which um turns into uh which turns into social responsibility um and i've included you know being an ally that is incredibly important to myself and also amongst my friends who are within the same generation and um being an ally doesn't necessarily doesn't mean that you have to share the identity but you believe in a cause you recognize the cause and you you show up you show up to help and you show up to to, to help where you can um and yeah ex like i was saying with with movements there they they never have to be isolated to the people that are directly involved it is always for example with the black lives matter movement you have you have people who are black but you also have allies you also have friends family that show up for one another um and that's that's the same with um ending fgm you have survivors but you also have friends families teachers doctors nurses politicians um and that is how you create a truly sustainable uh, movement um, and here we also have creating change uh, with with um, I think Ada touched on it um, with recognizing um, with recognizing intersectionality we we sort of inform ourselves and help ourselves recognize who is missing who is not here who, is, who has not had a chance to speak um, and through recognizing that we in turn we place pressure on powers to recognize communities and and groups and actively support them i think ada was talking about systemic oppression we we have that power to say hey you are not you are not representing or you're not even recognizing there are so many countries where where groups of people are not even recognized um and that and that in 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 turn is a form of systemic oppression um and yes by involving uh more people into shaping laws and policies 
that is how we make a truly inclusive and sustainable society. Um, similar to the youth manifesto that we made, that was us being actively involved in shaping what, what we would like activism and campaigns to look like. Uh, which brings me on to the next slide about our Yes, okay. So this is uh, the purple chair, as Anna um, very kindly mentioned. Uh, so this is our YouTube channel that we, uh, that our, us, as, us as youth ambassadors decided to make. Um, and yes, it's a youth, uh, YouTube channel, but we also wanted it to be a tool for young people. Again, that was made by young people. Um, and in making um, uh, the cause for ending FGM accessible language is so crucial in that it's um, a lot of times you know people only come across um, FGM through news reports or if they come across um, you know a very formal report it's always done in a very formal setting but by having um, by speaking about FGM in a very accessible way in an informal way it really allows people to understand and inform themselves which again as I said, you know, creates a whole movement and creates a whole in, um, in environment where uh, you break down taboos um, and yeah, you, you join the cause. Um, and it makes it, it makes it so much stronger just because it's accessible um, with YouTube, you know, I mean, I think COVID has really highlighted the digital divide that we have, um, but it's, I think this is absolutely like this is this is something that we are very proud to have um, and really like to do more with um, which brings me on to the next slides I think you can see yes so you can see um, some of the videos that we've made um, and uh, so my one the second one um, that's about knowing your rights and again, um, as someone who has privilege, it's important to create, uh, to recognise opportunities to use your platform and um, bring people on of different um, identities and pass them the mic. Uh, so we spoke about knowing your rights and just by, have it, by having friends on who are from Cert, uh, who have certain identities, it really opens up a discussion where we spoke about um, laws and how uh, uh, people of the LGBT plus community are completely discriminated against um, and how uh, sometimes our viewing of FGM is very um, binary. A lot of people who um, have have had FGM, they may not necessarily identify as a woman, they may be non-binary. So how how does that how does that impact and how can we do better to recognize where sometimes we fall short in our activism and in our inclusivity um, by simply having conversations and platforming them for other people to have access to and for other people to um, ponder on and discuss. Uh, yes, so that is that is everything about the purple chair. I think there's a slide, yes, where you can um, follow the NDFGME network. Um, and yes, please uh, look up the purple chair and share widely. Um, and we're all very proud of it. There's so many other um, ambassadors who I consider friends um, from different countries um, and there's different languages as well. So it's very, very um, varied. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Hadil. Uh, I think we um, that was really, really great to hear about your experience, about what you as well as the other young you know, youth ambassadors have been doing. Uh, but there was a lot I saw from some reactions in the uh, comment section that I think your intervention really spoke to a lot of people. But um, on my personal note, I can say that, I mean, the fact you were saying how important it is to recognize who is not there to speak and uh, to recognize and and therefore also then ensure to empower and ensure to give space um, to people who are not there to speak how important that is and then of course for me as someone who started out my career in youth activism I cannot agree more in on the fact of uh, that young people should definitely not be underestimated and uh, that we young people really have uh, an important voice and need to be meaningfully engaged. So thank you so much, Hadil, for your intervention. Um, when 
we work on addressing diversity of FGM affected communities without visibility and data on the state of the practice globally in Europe. It is through studying the data of the prevalence of FGM and on the populations affected by the practice that we can make sure that our work is the most inclusive and impactful possible. Data is really very important when working on these issues and for everyone who is working on this, you know the challenge that we are facing, the fact that in a lot of cases we are lacking data and we need more of it. Um, and this is really, really important uh, for uh, well, for knowing where the state is, but also for um, advancing uh, our cause and actually being able to know what's, what's happening uh, on the ground. But in order to actually give us some, some data that there exists, we have asked Sitske uh, Steneke, uh, who is the director of the United uh, Nations Populations Fund of, of the Brussels office, to join us here to present the report on the state of the world population on harmful practices, which is titled Against My Will. Sitske previously, before her current role as UNFPA Brussels director, uh, she represented the UNFPA in the Russian Federation in Honduras, in El Salvador, and has held several positions at the UNFPA headquarters in New York as well. She holds a master degrees in public health and developing uh, countries from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and, the, and in international law from Leiden University. Sitke, we are so delighted to have you here and we are very excited to um, hear your presentation uh, of the report and the very, very interesting insights that are there. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Anna. Very happy to be here. Um, Miriam will be um, uh, sharing my presentation. Um, as you said, uh, the report, uh, the most recent state of world population report is called Against My Will, um, defying the practices that harm women and girls and undermine equality. Every day, uh, I'm sure many, many people, if not all who are on this webinar know, but I still want to state it. Every day, hundreds of thousands of girls around the world are subjected to practices that harm them physically and psychologically and this happens with the full knowledge and consent of their families, friends and communities. Those practices reduce and limit the capacity of those girls and women also the, who undergo such practices to participate fully in society and to reach their full potential. The impact of this is felt throughout society and reinforces the very gender stereotypes and inequalities that gave rise to the harm in the first place. The human cost as well as the cost to society is enormous. So the report looks at 19 different types of harmful practices ranging from breast ironing to virginity testing that, are that all those practices are grounded in negative at attitudes about the value of girls and are a means for controlling their bodies and sexuality, as several of the speakers already said. Of those harmful practices, the ones that are perhaps most wi widespread are female genital mutilation, FGM, and child marriage. But before moving to the, the content of the report, imagine a girl. She's 16, she wakes up one day to find out that she's going to go through some rite of passage. A few hours later, the, her genitals are cut by a woman who does this to all the girls in the village. Now imagine another girl. She is 12 years old, she loves school. Her teacher says she has a gift for math. Then one morning when she wakes up, her parents tell her to put on her nicest clothes. In a couple of hours, she's gonna going, she's going to go to get married to a neighbor who is three times her age. Probably she'll never be able to go back to school. Of course, we all know there is no need to imagine those girls because they are real and this, this, these scenarios play out tens of thousands of times a day, every day, all over the world. Next slide, please. Now let us have a look at uh, female genital mutilation, FGM. Uh, some of the figures were already mentioned, but here you have them. Um, a girl subjected to FGM at first faces severe pain, trauma, and the risk of infection, bleeding, or even death. Throughout her life, 
She may struggle with reproductive tract infections, chronic back pain, painful intercourse and loss of sexual pleasure, and difficulties in childbirth. She will also be more likely to suffer from mental illnesses, including post-traumatic post stress disorder. Um, some 200 million girls and women alive today have undergone some form of the FGM. And as we heard also from Commissioner Dali, uh, about uh, an estimated 600,000 of them uh, live in Europe. This year and every year around the world, more than 4, mi 4 million girls are subjected to this practice. In addition, uh, medicalization of FGM is a worrying trend. An estimated 52 million women and girls worldwide have undergone FGM performed by doctors, nurses, or midwives. In Egypt or Sudan, about eight in, te in 10 girls have undergone uh, FGM done in the office of a health professional. And of course, under any circumstances, FGM violates human rights. And when performed by a health professional, it also violates medical ethics. But on the other side, opposition against FGM is building. As more and more women, girls, men and boys learn about FGM and the harm that it does, opposition to the practice is growing. In the last two decades, the proportion of girls and women in high prevalence countries who want to practice to stop has doubled. And this is even more the case in, in, with young people. Next slide, please. And let's have a look at another uh, very stubborn and widespread uh, harmful practice, child marriage. Um, in many cases, uh, child brides are also survivors of FGM or are at, at risk for FGM. A girl forced into an early marriage will in many cases drop out of school, diminishing her earning, earning potential and autonomy later in life. She may find herself socially isolated and depressed. And she may get pregnant whether she wants it or not uh, and before her body is ready leading to health risks and consequences for her and her baby. Child marriage is banned almost everywhere, yet they still happen tens of thousands times a day, every day, all around the world, cutting across countries, cultures, religions, and ethnicities. Globally, about one in every five girls is or was a child bride. Some 650 million women alive today in the world were married off before their 18th birthdays. Child marriage is most common in, in Africa, especially in West and Central Africa, but also in Latin America and the Caribbean. One in four girls is married or in a relationship. Beyond limiting a girl's education and earning potential, child marriage undermines her ability to make autonomous choices about her own body and future. Married girls have earlier pregnancies, more pregnancies, and closer together pregnancies. The impact of child marriage is felt beyond the girl whose life it derails. It, it perpetuates a cycle of poverty for her family and community, and it undercuts the development of a productive skilled workforce with a direct bearing on the economy of the country where she lives. Next slide, please. Now, what, the, what harmful practices have in common is that they are rooted in gender inequality. This was already said before. And in a desire to control women's bodies, sexuality, and lives. Gender equality, as you all know, is an agreed global goal under Agenda 2030 for Sustainable Development, which explicitly calls for ending all forms of discrimination, violence, and harmful practices against all women and girls. There is even a specific target for the elimination of harmful practices, including FGM. As the human rights, health, education, and human potential of women and girls are diminished, so is all of humanity. When so many girls are unwanted, uh, given away, traded, sold, cut, our, com our common future is undermined. Next slide, please. The good news is we have tools. We know what to do, and we know how we could end those harmful practices. There are concrete steps that countries uh, and communities can and do take. 
the international community overwhelmingly agrees that harmful practices cannot be tolerated. Governments have taken steps to end harmful practices, often um, uh, enacting and enforcing laws, banning them. Laws, of course, alone are not enough. Uh, it's very important that national plans bring together uh, all kinds of different uh, stakeholders, communities, local and religious leaders, um, community elders, service providers, ensuring broad support. Decades of experience and research show that bottom-up grassroots approaches are best at bringing change because communities themselves are best suited to transform themselves. And there must, of course, be efforts to change minds. Programs to change social norms are effective in rooting out uh, harmful practices, but they must not focus narrowly on the practice itself. They should address broader issues, including the subordinate role and position of women and girls, their human rights, intersectionality, and how to elevate their status and access to opportunities. At the same time, we must address the problem by tackling the root causes. Gender discrimination and harmful practices thrive on, on uh, biased norms and stereotypes. While norms or stereotypes are just ideas, they can be powerful, destructive forces. At the same time, because they are ideas, they can change no matter how deeply rooted they are. We have to address the subordinate position of women and girls in, so in society. And in this regard, men and boys have a special role to play. Many more men need to use their privilege as the preferred sex in patriarchal societies to raise the value of girls and demand equal treatment and equal rights. Economies and legal systems must be restructured to guarantee every woman equal opportunities. The goal is to end harmful practices by the end of this decade, but we still have a very, very long way to go. While the rates of harmful practices have been falling in the last decade, the absolute number of, of girls subjected to FGM are growing, largely because of population growth. Before summing up um, the report, let me say a few words about the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. Next slide, please. At the time that we finished the report, we were not even sure of the huge uh, impact that COVID-19 would have uh, on, on the issues that we're talking about. But by now, it, we know that delays in programs, uh, closing of schools and economic hardship have had and are having negative consequences for the efforts to roll back harmful practices. We also know that national and international efforts to bring an end to harmful practices have scaled back and stalled because of the pandemic. If those delays in programs uh, at ending FGM uh, would last for say two years, we don't know how long they will last, but we hope shorter, but if it lasts two years, that would mean that an additional two million girls could be sub subjected to FGM over the next decade. While the pandemic certainly makes our job harder, maybe it also represents an opportunity to imagine a different future. Um, a future in which the girls we just imagined um, have the power to be free of harm uh, and control their own destiny. Far from dampening our ambition, I would say that the pandemic has sharpened our resolve. Next slide, please. Finally, um, let me sum up the, 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 the report in just three words. Firstly, respect. We must foster respect for women and girls by changing entrenched attitudes and practices that dehumanize and commoditize them. This means disrupting root causes of inequality and its intersectional nature and respecting girls' autonomy. Second, protect. We must protect women and girls by enacting and enforcing laws against practices like female genital mutilation, but also by changing attitudes and norms. Parents need to understand the long-term harm of these practices and take a stand against them. And finally, fulfill. 
governments must fulfill their obligations under human rights treaties and require and require that require elimination of FGM and child marriage. The 25th anniversary of the Beijing conference and the year before that of the Cairo conference provided some new momentum uh, to this, this, this movement. And the truth is, is, if gender equality were a reality, there would be no FGM. At the same time, ending FGM is a necessity for achieving gender equality. The elimination of FGM and gender equality are inter interdependent, mutually reinforcing goals. All of us together, communities, activists like Adil, uh, civil society organizations, parliamentarians, governments, UN organizations, we cannot stop until the rights and choices and bodies of all girls are fully their own. And we can't let anything, not even the COVID-19 pandemic, get in our way. Next slide, please. In 2012, um, the, the United Nations General Assembly designated 6 February as the International Day of Zero Tolerance for Female Genital Mutilation with the aim of amplifying and focusing the efforts on its elimination. Communities and activists are working tirelessly to change social norms, attitudes and laws. Together, UNFPA and UNICEF are running two of the world's largest collaborations uh, to end harmful practices against women and girls, specifically FGM and child marriage. And this is also supported by the EU, among many other donors. We know what works. We should tolerate no excuses. No more violence against women and girls. It's time to unite around proven strategies fund them adequately and act. No time for inaction. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sitzke. I think uh, your last words there of us needing to unite around this common cause and funding adequately and is really hit home. I think that's really true. And uh, also what you were sharing of the adverse impacts of COVID, of how it's, um, well, worsened uh, the situation or was quite striking and stark, and I'm sure um, you might get some follow-up questions about that, but I very much appreciated your reflection of uh, us dreaming of another reality and where we do have, uh, have achieved gender equality, I think, striving, well, imagining what could be and imagining what we are fighting for is um, really important and it uh, it keeps our ambitions high and I think that uh, is really important as well. So thank you so much for um, your intervention. Um, in just a few minutes I am going to open the floor uh, to the Q&A question. Uh, um, mm -hmm. Okay, sorry, I didn't think I'm up. And the way this will work is that because I can't see you all on the on the screen, there's uh, and I'm very happy to say there's too many of us, so I can't see see you all. So therefore, I will ask you to please uh, insert like write your question in the chat, or you can write your name in the chat, and I will call on you. Um, and then please, when you are given the floor, uh, if you can introduce yourself. Uh, and uh, well, your position as well, so that we know uh, who's talking and uh, from where. So, uh, and then we'll make sure that, um, well, the panelists can answer your questions. But just before that, uh, since the reason we're here today is also to, I mean, it's of course to um, mark the International Day for Zero, Zero Tolerance for FGM, but it's also to launch our campaign. Um, I would like to ask um, Miriam Mahmedi, our communications officer, to just introduce uh, the campaign to you in a, a few words. Um, of course, um, you'll see a lot more uh, in the coming days um, of all the material and so you know watch uh, watch our space but uh, please do um, 
well, listen also to, to Miriam, where she will give a first insight of what is to come. So please, Miriam. Thank you very much, Anna. Um, so yes, so today we are launching our 2021 annual campaign, uh, which is titled uh, FGM and Intersectionality Addressing FGM uh, While Leaving No One Behind. And the hashtag is this one that you see on the screen. So hashtag NFGM for all. Um, so over the next year, we will focus on the great diversity of uh, FGM affected communities. Um, and that diversity could be from ethnic background to religious background to their gender identity, sexuality, their ability or disability. And we will be exploring a new topic uh, every month. Uh, and these topics range from FGM and racism to FGM and religious discrimination to FGM and disability, but also um, topics such as FGM and minors and how we can better address and protect um, F F minors from FGM, sorry. Um, so yes, we will be reflecting on how to create space and properly address uh, FGM for all. Uh, FGM affected communities, whatever their um, background is. And we will do that um, until December 2021. So please um, follow us on social media to follow this campaign. Uh, we will be um, publishing materials such as infographics, videos, but we will also be organizing further events on the different topics with partners. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Miriam. Um, I am now going to open the Q&A uh, session. So as I said, if you do have any questions uh, or even comments and reflections, it's, it's uh, also more than welcome. Please just, uh, yeah, you can either type the name or the question itself in the chat uh, and I will then um, give you the floor. Uh, but to begin with, I will give the floor to, um, Ah, well, I will start with, because uh, I had a, a sneak question from Isma, our programs coordinator, um, who would like to ask a question. And after that, uh, I will also give the floor to du Duany um, to ask a question as well. And then I will pass it on back to the panelists. So Isma, please. Thank you, Anna. Uh, thank you all so much. I really appreciated your presentations. And big shout out to Hadil, who I'm very proud of. Proud of. You did a great job. Um, I have a question for Aida, um, more within the intersectional perspective. Like you briefly mentioned, um, the language barrier that sometimes um, people can face, people of colors can face, like they don't necessarily speak the language or they're not very fluent in the language of the country where they live in. So I would love to, to know. Um, how can we ensure inclusivity and access to information when it comes to health and ensure that intersectionality might be maybe the way uh, to ensure that FGM survivors have access to information? Like, what would you suggest? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, I would love to hear um, any suggestion that you might have. And also because I know that we kind of previously discussed a bit about that, but I would love to hear it a bit more. Thank you so much. Thank you, Isma. And uh, Duany, please, do you have a question? Mute. Okay, you can hear me now? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, I'm Duany Elvige. Um, I have been uh, with NFGM sometime in the past as a assistant program coordinator. And currently, I'm a freelancer. So I'm so very much interested in FGM issues as an activist. And uh, I very much appreciate the work of uh, NFGM a lot and many other organizations here in Europe that are interested in, the, in, in this fight. Um, and I know that a lot, a lot is being done. A lot, a lot of things are being done to, you know, to bring this this practice to an end and like uh, um, um, Helena the commissioner also said yeah she and, and, and uh, Siska 
you 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 made mention of the fact that there is some improvement, which I'm very happy to hear. Uh, but I'm a little concerned about how do you reconcile the difference that is we there's a lot of um, awareness and activism, but we still have such high number of people at risk. How do you how do you reconcile that you know that difference? How, what, where, where do you think we are going wrong in activism of uh, that people still are at risk and people still are practicing it? Thank you so much, Duany. I will now pass back to uh, our panelists. Uh, maybe I'll start with Aida, um, since there was one directly for her, uh, before I take the next uh, um, round of questions. Okay. Uh, so, is my question was about language and how do we deal with uh, with translation? I guess I think you were talking about translation. How do we make sure that information uh, is shared with people who do not speak the local language in our different context? Or um, how do yeah how we we make things accessible? Uh, talking specifically about FGM and health issues. I think that the first thing is certain messages tend to be uh, translated. Like we know that uh, the last project from the GAMS uh, was translated in many, many languages because um, an organization working on FGMs usually have a lot of community um, I don't know, you say community relays, community links uh, to actually come and translate for people who need translation. Mm -hmm. um, what, I, what I notice in my work is that for some subjects, we think that translation is required. For example, talking about FGM, as we imagine this never happens here and no one local is ever uh, concerned, we tend to translate a lot. But we do not think about intersectionality. And for example, a lot of information about LGBTQI plus issues that may actually have links with people who have faced FGMs, who have survived FGMs, may not be translated. And uh, one of the information, one of the things we have about translation is that I know that uh, we have people from communities translating when we talk about FGMs, but in queer communities, we usually require people, LGBTQI plus people, to make the translation for people to actually feel safe discussing their sexuality, their gender identities, and so on and so forth. And so where there is a lack of crossing when we talk about queer people who have faced FGMs because they may not feel comfortable discussing FGMs and their sexuality uh, with, I mean, they may, be, they may feel comfortable talking about FGMs with within FGM organizations with uh, community members to translate, but they may not feel comfortable talking about their sexualities, not knowing where they stand. And on the other way, in LGBTQI plus uh, organizations, I mean, not all languages are uh, represented and it's very, very hard to tackle it. So I guess one of the solutions would make sure to actually have some relays. Like if you know that some of your members are queer and uh, have faced FGN, see if they want to take part in the conversation and maybe be there. Uh, one of the things that's possible also is having uh, posters that emphasizes that both things can happen at once. So at least people who are concerned by the subject can speak out loud and be there. Um, but of course, I think that the main point is very interesting about translation is that we tend to only translate what we think is relevant to people who do not speak a language, when actually all information is relevant for everyone. Not to do any propaganda on LGBTQI plus issues, but we have to realize that LGBTQI plus people are about 10 to 15 percent of the population globally, which is the same amount as Caucasian people globally. So there are as many white people than people who are LGBTQI plus. So that's also an interesting fact to know in uh, in this subject, but of course we could widen it to so many other subjects uh, than LGBTQI plus issues combined with FGMs. Does this answer your question? I hope I hope so. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, Aida. Um, I don't know if uh, Sitkit, would you want to try and answer the second question about reconciling the difference? Uh, um, well, in particular between, you know, that we still have so many girls at risk. Mm. Yeah, uh, thank you, Edvige. Um, yeah, about 
it's always so maddening that you know you have progress so we work hard uh, there is progress but at the same time there's population growth so uh, even though we are progressing the absolute number of girls at risk goes up so that is you know it's so clearly we're not going fast enough so we're not on track for 2030 that much is clear and another element i think what we're really talking about is social norms change and that is not fast. No, it, it only works uh, when it's grassroots bubbling up uh, with all the help on the other levels and it's slow progress and, and I'm, I wish I had the, the silver bullet <laughs> to make that happen faster but I have come to the conclusion that social norms change is, is, um, is slow. I hope that answers your question. Sorry, um, I was <laughs> momentarily muted. Um, Hadil, do you want to add some thoughts uh, to uh, these two points? Maybe also, I mean, on language barriers that you have seen in your activism? Otherwise, uh, I'll sorry. open the floor. Um, the first question I didn't write down, so I, I can't remember it, to be honest with you. <laughs> um, but the second question, um, just... Um, about uh, yes, activism. Um, yeah, there is, there uh, there are lots of people that are engaged in activism. But in terms of um, FGM, we want to still happening. Um, I would I would just reinforce um, what uh, Seth said um, about um, cultural attitudes and how it's um, how it's a it's a process. It doesn't happen overnight, um, and that again it's very important to work with um with communities um but, but also done it's very sensitive it, it it should be done in a way where um there is no um sort of sort of a uh, hierarchy a lot of the times um especially especially being muslim you know uh, for a lot of people that aren't really knowledgeable um about FGM, there are assumptions that it is very it is um, ingrained in Islam, which isn't the case at all. Um, and you find yourself having to um, sort of, uh, well, personally, like um, defend my faith, which makes which which is very um, sort of sort of discouraging because you're you're in you're in the fight and you're in the cause. Um, but I, I think language like I said before is very very important um, and um, Isma also um, taught me that as well just um, to when when like I was talking about in, in terms of informing ourselves and informing others language is so crucial um, and the way you use it can really um, determine um, how 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 if people will listen to your message really um, yeah that's that's what I had for that Thank you so much, Hadil. Um, I will now take, just also preparing the panelists for this, three, three questions and then I'll pass back to the panelists. So uh, this will be from uh, first uh, Michaela. Um, I apologize if I mispronounce any names in advance. It's not my intention, but wait, from first uh, Michaela Lafratta. So first, uh, hello, uh, nice to meet you all. Thank you for inviting me to this. Um, I'm a journalist specialized in human rights, and I, th I think it's a super interesting uh, webinar. Uh, my question is related to COVID-19, uh, and it's about um, what you think um, about it. I mean, uh, if you know, if you have an estimation about the impact that COVID-19 has or will have, on uh, ending FGM and directly or indirectly and actually can, what can be done to tackle it or if maybe we can take an advantage of technology now that a lot of things are actually happen like for example this webinar. I don't know if uh, technology can be an advantage or a disadvantage uh, when tackling um, you know like to end FGM. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Michaela. Uh, next, I give the floor to Eleni Petraki from Greece. Uh, 
otherwise I will read her question is um, if you might know if there are any official data for FGM practices amongst the refugees and migrants population, uh, in particular, if possible, living in Greece. Um, and then I'd like to uh, give the floor to uh, Sianan Russell. Thanks very much. Um, uh, my question is uh, maybe a bit difficult for me to put into a, a quick sentence, but uh, hearing both uh, Aida and uh, Adil speak about uh, groups who are uh, pushed further to the margins in these conversations, I would love to hear uh, specifically from Adil about the the kinds of good practice you've seen about making it so that uh, non-binary people and trans men as well as lesbians are able to participate in support conversations uh, as, as well as if you have any good practice related to women who are also intersex participating in support conversations uh, around exposure to, to FGM. Um, because of, of just what you were speaking about Ida with translation issues but also the the intersecting trauma of uh, you know one's body, one's sexual orientation, and one's genitals being mutilated, having this uh, very personal interrelation where many survivors who are from these communities struggle to find their own narratives among groups of heterosexual, cisgender uh, women and girls. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Um, I will then, uh, I'll start by giving uh, the floor to Sitske and then I'll move on to Hadil and Aida. <laughs> yeah, I would, would like to say something uh, to Michaela about the impact of COVID-19. Uh, well, the, uh, the other questions are coming. I will put a link uh, in the in the chat uh, because the, it is interesting, uh, of course, to, to and, and necessary to look at what the, what the impact is and what we can do about it. It's of course uh, economic hardship which will follow the, the pandemic uh, in many, many countries. That is a proven factor in, in uh, uh, FGM and especially child marriage. So um, that's one thing, that's one aspect. The closing of schools. Uh, schools have a protective function uh, because uh, uh, parents may be afraid that uh, the girl who goes to school, uh, you know, let that a forbidden practice it comes out because the girls is in school if the schools are closed so that protective factor is no longer there. Um, so um, we did uh, a sensitivity analysis uh, looking at, uh, as I said, you know, if the uh, if if the programs to to combat those harmful practices are you know like stalled by the pandemic, um, the estimates is that this could lead to uh, a, a two million extra cases of FGM over the next ten years, uh, and uh, thirteen million more cases of child marriage than would otherwise have occurred. I hope that answers your questions. I'm going to look for the link right now. Thank you, Sitske. Um, Hadil? Sorry, I was finding my mute button. Um, sorry, I don't know if this question was directed at me. Um, I wasn't too sure. Um, so I didn't prepare an answer, um, to be honest with you. <laughs> oh, it's, it's okay. Um, I, I, I think it was more directed to Aida, but uh, I, maybe I thought you had some thoughts, but uh, Aida, I'm sure, has uh, quite a lot to say. <laughs> sure. Uh, I mean, I'm sure Hadil do too, but um, I mean, it's, it's a very interesting case to think about LGBTQI, uh, especially lesbian, bisexual women who, have, who are survivors of FGM, trans men who have uh, faced FGM as well, and non-binary people, and also intersex women who have faced FGM, IGM, combination. Um, and I think that uh, our first step, of course, and it takes a lot of time, uh, it's to revolutionize language. Because again, we tend to talk about FGM as being something that happens to women. 
and I like it in, I mean, in English, it works well because we, we talk about female and so we actually talking about sexual characteristics. So it would work in other, like we can still say FGM and say FGM and people next to it. I mean, I personally talk about people who survived FGM and not just women and girls because they are not all just women and girls. Uh, so even, even if a majority of them may identify as such and be women and girls, but still, the others matter too. And it's important to bring them with us and so to name them. So talking about people instead of women is not such a big shift. It's going to be much harder in, langu in language that are more gendered, like French, for example. Uh, <laughs> so I think that another thing that needs to be recognized here, uh, because indeed, I mean, my experience is mostly with um, the rare people who actually come out of of this and uh, let us know that they are both lesbians or at least were bisexual, pansexual, and uh, have faced FGM because there is a real issue of communication. Not just about languages, even if languages are not a matter, there is a real problem because, um, well, um, the feminist movement, the white feminist movement came through uh, lesbian circles, and so there is kind of an obsession for certain parts of the vulva. Uh, which can be very uncomfortable when you meet someone and want to have sexual encounter or something because it's not always easy to just bring it on the table and there is such a taboo around it and it's seen such a like such a fringe effect and I mean we've heard the numbers we know that people facing FGM there are a lot of them so of course they are part of the are, some of them have to navigate these um, these relationships and handle how to introduce them and it's something that is absolutely not thought of outside of human rights circles and um, and it's also pictured the way we talk about it as we ma we mentioned and Anna mentioned at the beginning also is that we it's re stigmatized to certain communities it's we imagine that FGM only happened uh, in sub-Saharan Africa and in certain communities and apparently only with Muslim people like this is the the general idea so we need to have much more uh, talk even inside of LGBTQI plus organization, but everywhere about what it is, the fact that it happens, that it happens a lot, and that it's not such a fringe effect. Um, another point that's really important is seeing actually the problem with the migration patterns linked to LGBTQI plus people and how it may completely erase uh, people who have faced FDM, because most of the people who migrate uh, and now we are specifically talking about people from a migrant background, so this is very specific, of course, it's not all of the people with FGMs, but um, people who migrate uh, for LGBTQI plus issues, they are usually, most of them are uh, cis gay, cisgender gay men simply for a question of access and so on, because that's why they ask for asylum. Uh, asylum seekers who come for, uh, who may have faced FGM usually may come through this, but then not be uh, received and heard when it comes to sexual orientation because it's not pictured in the, um, in, in, the same, in the same sentence. And we have to remember that people who flee for LGBTQI plus issues or who are LGBTQI plus and uh, migrate usually may flee governments, laws, culture, whatever, but also communities which would be, uh, could be quite similar with FGM, I guess. But that means that they may not feel comfortable getting in conversation with people with of their own communities, not knowing if they can trust or not, which may be right or wrong because homophobia is everywhere. Transphobia is everywhere and intersex phobia is everywhere. Uh, it's not just something that happens uh, in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. And again, just a little reminder that most of the homophobic laws come from colonial laws. Uh, that was my little point there. So I think I answered your question. I hope I answered your question. If there is anything else, uh, let me know. But um, I'm trying uh, to, I think that we can focus on language. I don't know if I inspired something, Hadil, and you have something else to say there. Yay. <laughs> no, sorry, that was my, that was my mistake. I got confused with questions. Um, yes, just to reinforce what um, Ada was saying about um, accessible language is so, so important. Um, and again, who, who do we, who do we, um, exclude when we talk about FGM. Um, you know, uh, personally, I, which I'm trying to check myself on, is I fall into the habit of saying women. It, it's not. It's not just women. Um, so that that is definitely um, something um, that we can do um, in terms of be best practice um, when um, talking about the uh, topic of FGM. Um, and again, um, like I was saying before. 
um, uh, sensitivity towards um, people's cultures um, because uh, we're, we're all in agreement that uh, this practice must end but there are people um, it, it should not it should not attack um someone in the process um if that makes sense um it's it's very important that we um we 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 reass we reassess the dynamic because um oftentimes um in the media um f g m um, will be called you know barbaric or um and and those are re that's really that word is very very deep rooted um when you use the word barbaric um and um yes so um absolutely um accessible language um, and sensitivity is so so important um but yeah just to reinforce everything that Ada said very very um yeah well put argument um again i hope that answers the question yeah thank you so much um and now i'm gonna start going to the last uh, round of questions so um in case you have any please let me know in the chat but uh, um i know through direct message that uh, chiara uh, would like to ask a question who is our head of policy and advocacy yes thank you anna and first of all i really wanted to say a big thank you to all the speakers because it has been truly inspiring uh, hearing uh, from you and I'm sure for all the people that are um, here and also watching our Facebook live. So thank you so much. Um, yeah, my question, putting my advocacy hat on, um, is uh, because we know here in the room there are institutions uh, from the European Commission, but also from member states. Um, we also have, of course, Ege present. Uh, you've seen uh, Jurgita answering some um, data on, uh, on, on Greece. So I just wanted to ask maybe each of you, uh, panelists, if you would have one recommendation to the EU and to, uh, you know, member states to specifically looking at intersectionality, because we, as, as Aida very well said at the beginning, it's, it's not just a buzzword. It really needs to be um, uh, applied. And so what what would you recommend to the institutions that uh, because they are listening here so i think it's a great opportunity and that's what we want to do at the end of gm european network also to give you the platform to to talk to the decision makers and tell them what they have to do so um, yes that was my my question to to all of you thank you thank you uh, very much chiara and um, i also have uh, a question as well um, where i mean in some of the presentations that were mentioned today how important it is to exactly involve communities themselves to involve and that uh, grassroots approaches really are the most effective ones and so maybe i was wanted to ask each of the speaker if you can maybe highlight a great example from your experience or that you've seen of this where it really has made a difference uh, just because sometimes i think um, yeah, real examples and stories really shine through. Uh, so these um, are the questions we wanted to ask you. Um, I'm just trying to think. Um, is there any one of you who wants to go first, rather than me picking? Because I feel if I if I may, Anna, I will. I I just saw. I was looking on the UNFPA website. I saw a really interesting story about Kenya. Uh, that women who for decades have been cutters uh, who have now taken on a different role actually advocating for abandoning uh, FGM. I'll put a link to that also in the chat. <laughs> Thanks. Just to answer the first question about um, recommendations um, to institutions, I have I have two instead of one. Um, the first one is um, uh, if we if we really want to be intersectional, do not do not reduce it to a day or a campaign. It has to be ongoing. Do not wait for the opportunity to come about. Um, which of course, like it's all great that we're here, but I think in order for it to be long term and sustainable, we have to keep on going. Um, so to to rely upon um, you know specific days, um, you know days in the calendar or campaigns um, is a starting point, but we have to keep it going from there. Um, and I would also say um, employ people, employ people, and give people you know um, 
contracts where you pay them if you want if you want to um if you want consultants i think that's what we should call people consultants recognized people that come from communities um where where um fgm is happening if you genuinely do you want to hear and actively involve them in the process hire them pay them recognize them as consultants um and you know in terms of like the top-down approach give them the funds give the grassroots um activists and organizations the funds um and 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 they they will take it from there because they they genuinely genuinely know um they're they're very they're they're from the communities and they really really um they they know that's what i'm trying to say um and also in terms of um who holds um high positions personally um i've had the opportunity to go um um on conferences um with ndfgm and a lot of a lot of people that hold quite high positions are, are white um and i've I, I don't really see people of colour. Um, so again, pay, pay, pay people um, and also um, allow them to, to kind of um, take positions where they lead. Um, because I think it's, it's great that, you know, organisations are doing work with communities, but organisations themselves have to reevaluate um, where, where they can improve. Thank you. I will bounce off what you just said. Uh, indeed, I would definitely start by talking about diversity. It's a very, tr it's a very um, trendy word too. We like to hear it. Uh, we don't really like to perform it. Uh, gender is not enough. I mean, it's it's been working uh, uh, in the last years. We've seen that so many women are part of the European. Um, network of the European functioning, but we need to go further because indeed, um, I mean, I have, I'm yet to meet anyone higher placed in the European Commission, European Parliament, who are people of color. Um, and we do see that uh, when we see, for example, especially black women, black women, the only I've seen are interns, past internship, they disappear. There's a leaking pipeline, they just disappear. And even as interns, they are a great, great, great minority. And I think it's really important to remember that expertise is also, experience is also expertise. And that the ideal candidate for you is something, someone who has the expertise maybe from books and research and so on, but also the experience, because they can see much further. That's what intersectionality is about. It's really going deep. It's going at the root. It is a radical practice. And radicality is very scary, especially in politics. We don't like the word radical, but radical means grasping by the roots. We have to start there. And that's where grassroots come in also. And from what I see also from the project I'm working on and so on is that there is a huge divide, there's a ravine between institutions such as the European Commission and real life people in, who are working. I'm writing a toolkit for social workers and everything that comes out as toolkits are usually written in an academic language with 500 pages, I'm exaggerating, it's usually a bit less than this, but still you have 50 pages of introduction for social workers who are working in the field, they all have in common that they are in, they are in low numbers, they are underpaid, and they are overwhelmed. They don't have the time to go through this. And most of the people who are actually working in the field do not have one or two master's degrees. So they are not acquainted with such language. The institutional language is not accessible to most human beings. It is only accessible to, uh, you, to an elite who went through academic writing and then understands the shortcuts that institutional writing creates. So this is very important. Just remember, expertise is, experience is expertise. And it's time to question the norm because we tend to not see, we don't look at race because again, Second World War, uh, there is a long history there and I definitely don't have the time to linger on it. But uh, it's very important to examine the norm, examine also the coloniality of what we are doing. How are we acting as saviors rather than going to see people and actually 
asking what they need and going from there from the roots, because this is something that tends to happen a lot. It's a top down approach and we just have to see how organizations are, are structured, who is at the head, where are the people who are concerned and so on. I mean, again, I'm not attacking anyone, but it's very important to actually just look at it, question the norm, question the coloniality of it. And uh, Hadil was also saying, have people lead, and I would say, go further than this, have people lead and make sure that they have the range to act. Because what happens is that when we do have people who are concerned by different marginalization, when you have multi-marginalized people in institutions, they always end up in situations where they cannot really act. It looks good, it looks intersectional, but in real life, there is no action that can actually be made. And most of the people who are multi-marginalized and work in an institution end up with a burnout and leave the institution. We have to wonder why, they are, why the people who were there are not there anymore and change things. Thank you so much. Um, I think uh, these last reflections are the perfect way to conclude our webinar today. Um, I would like to thank you all again for joining us and supporting our work. In particular, of course, I would like to thank our wonderful speakers uh, from, I mean, Commissioner Dali, but also to um, Hadil, Aida, and Sitske. Uh, this, you have brought so much You've educated us, you've uh, brought so much great reflections and discussions to our, and I think this is a great start to our campaign this year. I also want to take an opportunity to thank our members because it is thanks to our members that we are dedicating this year's campaign to leaving no one behind, to focusing on intersectionality, to going on this journey where we want to highlight issues but also question ourselves and learn along the way. So a big thank you to our members, to the board of NDFGM European Network and also to the amazing team, the Secretariat, Chiara, Isma and Miriam. And I think a big shout out to Miriam for the organization of today and the campaign. Um, it's uh, an amazing feat that you've done. Uh, and most importantly as well so a big thank you to everyone who's here to all your support it really is by acting together to working uh, together that we will achieve change and uh, by yeah raising our voices and really um, well as was said earlier by having a unified front and uh, this is what strengthens us and this is what actually will change so thank you so much for being here uh, and please continue uh, supporting us um, follow the campaign um, and yeah we really really look forward to sharing our exploration of intersectionality this year with you uh, throughout the coming months um, and we really truly believe here at NFGM European Network that we can only end FGM if we end FGM for all. Thank you so much. <laughs>